Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this talk arranged by the Sussex Local Network of the IET. I'm Bruce Rawlings, your convener this evening. Now it is my pleasure to welcome my colleagues, Jingyi Wan and Gaurav Mendirata of Mott MacDonald, who are going to give us a talk titled Powering a Low Carbon Future with Direct Current Technology. Jingyi Wan has a bachelor's and master's degrees in engineering from University of Cambridge. She is chair of Seagray UK Next Generation Network and is a chartered engineer. She is currently working as an HV cable systems specialist in Mott MacDonald, her technical expertise being focused on offshore wind farm, subsea power cable system, electrical design and manufacture. Jingyi was a finalist for the Subsea UK Young Emerging Talent Award 2018. She is also young expert of two Seagray insulated cable working groups alongside a group of global experts for industry standardization, as well as an executive member of Seagray NGN International and the UK National Committee. Before joining McDonald, Jingyi worked as a product development engineer for a subsea power cable supplier, where she worked as part of a team on the cables for the industry's first commercial 66 kV array cable project. Gaurav Mendirata has bachelor and postgraduate qualifications in the field of electrical engineering, power plant engineering and business and management from universities in India and UK. Gaurav is a chartered engineer with over 15 years of experience in the HVDC industry and is an HVDC converter specialist. He has been working with Mott McDonald since 2014 and has worked on about, 20, about 12 HVDC projects installed worldwide and has detailed experience in optioneering converter equipment and station design, project development, capex and opex analysis and reliability analysis. Prior to joining Mott McDonald, Gorath was employed by Alstom Grid, now known as GE Grid, and had worked in different technical roles, ensuring project design and delivery as per the procurement specifications for about nine years. I'm sure we are in for an interesting talk, and without further ado, I hand you over to Jingyi and Gorath, and I think Gorath is going to talk first, and I think Gorath has a problem with his camera, so you will not be able to see him, I'm afraid. And good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Gaurav Mandirata. Today's presentation will cover HVDC at a very high level. And by high level, I mean it's introductory and not technical or uh, HVDC scheme design oriented. HVDC system typically includes converter and uh, transmission circuit, which can be, can be a cable or overhead line. I will be talking about converter systems, whereas my colleague Jingi will cover cable systems. We will not be covering overhead line systems today for a very uh, simple reason, which is most of the HVDC schemes nowadays use uh, cables. So let's go on with the first slide. So what uh, really is HVDC? Some people say it is highly technical, very demanding and complex technology, but what really stand for, stands for is high voltage direct current. And like any other technology, it has some elements which are complex to design and then some other elements uh, which are straightforward or uh, simple to implement. Electricity grids that we see around us are mostly AC grids. And when this technology is used to connect existing grids, you know, for transmission of electricity, it converts, what it does is it converts AC to DC at sending and converter, which sometimes called rectifier, transmit DC between, between ends and converts DC to AC at receiving and converter, which sometimes called, which, which is called, which is also called inverter uh, at high voltage. And this can be seen from the picture at the bottom. So it's an AC that comes in at the sending end uh, called rectifier. And after conversion, it's a DC that uh, comes out and goes all the way to the, to the receiving end where DC is converted back to AC for feeding electricity into, into AC grid. You can also say, see from the, from the picture on top right side that there are uh, two technologies available to choose from 
when it comes to uh, transmitting power. One is HVDC, other one is HVAC. And this is the reason HVDC is often compared with HVAC for uh, benefits prior to its selection. What, next up is what are those benefits? So these benefits, those uh, can be economical uh, or cost, cost oriented, as well as technical or say design oriented. I've not uh, listed all the, all the benefits on the slide, but only the main ones. So uh, under economical uh, benefit, first one is HVDC CapEx, which includes converter station cost and transmission circuit cost, you know, is cheaper than HVAC over say long distance. Next uh, economical benefit is HVDC has lower losses than HVAC because HVDC for the same, for the same current, you know, takes into account only R, which is, which is resistance, whereas HVAC takes into account Z, impedance, you know, which is made up of uh, resistance and inductance or capacitors. HVDC has also lower maintenance cost than, than HVAC because of, uh, say, higher uh, availability or reliability and uh, results in lower net present cost, which is a CapEx minus OPEX, you know, making HVDC technology more feasible than HVAC. Under, say, uh, Technical benefits, HVDC can play an important role in connecting renewable uh, power with an inland existing uh, grid. HVDC can also say control power flow at faster rate than HVAC, which can improve uh, stability. And HVDC is the only technology. So this is not a point of comparison between two technologies. HVDC is the only technology, you know, with, that can be used to connect uh, or asynchronous systems, systems with different frequency, like a 50 hertz system with, with a 60 hertz system. Under economic benefits, I said about HVDC, say being cheaper than HVAC or long distance, but what is say that, that distance? So this picture shows if the transmission distance, so this distance is distance between the resending end converter and the receiving end converter station. So if say a transmission distance is for an overhead line type uh, HVDC, uh, uh, HVDC system is 600 kilometers or more than, than HVDC is cheaper than, than HVAC. Whereas if this distance for a cable type HVDC system um, is 70 kilometers or more then HVDC is cheaper than, than HVAC. Please uh, uh, note, uh, what I'm sharing today, say about break-even point, you know, uh, for for uh, or say applicable to overhead line HVDC system and cable uh, type HVDC system is is typical information or say data. In reality, this point, you know, is in fact a range would differ, you know, would change. Say for example, in transmission voltage, if uh, if, for example, if the voltage goes up, say, by hundreds of kilovolts, so for if we for the same power, you know, if instead of using 800 kV, we start using, say, 1.1 million volt or, say, 1100 kV, then this point, you know, could move left. And if it is then decreased by 100, you know, of kilovolt, then this point could also move, move uh, right. Uh, this slide, uh, you know, shows, uh, uh, I've included this slide just to show you the difference between the size of, say, HVAC and HVDC towers. So HVAC tower is the picture on the right, and HVDC tower is shown on the, on the picture on, on left. You know, so you clearly uh, see it's, it's the same, uh, say, tower, it's, it's this tower configuration for same voltage and power rating, and which you could see the difference you know, between between the sizes, which in the end drives the drives the cost. So bigger the higher size, higher the higher the cost. Uh, this slide, you know, demonstrate technical uh, benefit, one of the technical benefit, and shows how HVDC technology has say already been recognized within industry for playing a vital role in connecting renewable offshore power with an inland grid. You know, and what. I was saying earlier about, about break-even point usually arranged. So you could see this uh, at, at the bottom, the, if the wind say 
park is located more than 50 kilometers to 100 kilometers. So 50 to 100 is, is a range which uh, uh, at sea from land and has a generation larger than 200 megawatt, then HVDC is likely to be economical solution than, than HVAC. Looking ahead into, into the future, you know, HVDC market is, is anticipated, you know, or could be say worth $12.3 billion by 2024 and up to $50 billion by 2027. Uh, therefore, HVDC is, is an important global energy sector or say subsector to be active in. And uh, let's uh, you know learn more about about HVDC say, uh, technology. Uh, first one up is how old is this say technology? So uh, first world's first HVDC link that was put in commercial operation was almost uh, sixty uh, six years ago, and it had a rating of say twenty megawatt at a voltage of hundred kV. Now over over time. You know, this link uh, has been replaced with, with uh, or say upgraded with, with higher rating at a higher, higher voltage. Across globe, uh, we, there are now uh, 211 HVDC projects and counting. Uh, so there are, this, this slide shows where those, those HVDC projects are. And these projects are, you know, uh, either LCC or VSC. I'll talk about uh, LCC, VSC uh, on the next slide. So HVDC technology has say two sub-technologies, one is, or application type. One is, first one is LCC, which stands for line commutated converter. It uses uh, thyristors and uh, requires, you know, more space than the other application, which is, which is VSC. This slide uh, shows, you know, uh, a picture uh, for, or one of the converter station, you know, uh, for Western HVDC link. And uh, you could see the space uh, HVDC, L, sorry, LCC based converter, you know, uh, could be uh, as big as the space required to accommodate 11 say, football grounds and considerably more in case the DC voltage is raised further. So if this 600, KV, you know, raised further, this, this layout can, can really get bigger. Uh, next uh, application is VSC, which uh, stands for uh, Voltage Source Converter. It uses IGBTs and requires less space than LCC, as can be seen, say, from, uh, from the slide. Uh, uh, it can also be seen, you know, the DC voltage for say this particular layout is not say 600 kV. It's only say 275 uh, kV. But uh, uh, if the voltage say was 600 kV, the space uh, required for VSC uh, application would still be lower than, than LCC. The other say differences between LCC and uh, VSC then just the type of say uh, devices these applications use are uh, VSC produces less harmonics than than LCC. VSC can also you know do black start, but LCC can't, or LCC can, but with additional equipment, which once again you know uh, has an impact on the on the layout. VSC can connect with the weak AC system, perform better you know uh, uh, when connected with weak AC system, but LCC requires generally require stronger, you know, AC systems to, 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 to work efficiently uh, with. VSC can control active and reactive power independently in, in any direction. VSC, you know, with VSC, uh, when it comes to uh, change the power direction, it, it, uh, it, is, uh, it requires a change in the direction of, of current flow. Whereas with LCC, you know, we need to change the polarity uh, of, the, of the converters. And VSC use uh, cheaper XLP cables, you know, where LCC use uh, uh, expensive MI, mass impregnated uh, cables. Uh, however, having said all of this, uh, LCC is a, is a more mature uh, technology than VSC. VSC is still, say, emerging, you know. Uh, LCC, you know, is, is more suitable for bulk 
power transmission, or at least consider suitable for bulk uh, power transmission land, because VSC is still emerging, you know, uh, with LCC, uh, you would see in the in, in the world or across world that uh, uh, the DC voltages, you know, are uh, uh, or have gone up to 800 kV, whereas with the VSC, you know, the maximum, I think, DC voltage uh, is, is 400 kV. VSC is more suitable for connecting renewables, offshore power with land, and the simple reason is uh, the footprint. With VSC technology, you require less footprint, which, which can really have an impact on cost or say on fitting the equipment on the, on the platforms at, at sea. There are uh, uh, further configurations applicable to say both uh, sub-technologies, LCC and VSC. One first one is say back-to-back -back configuration, which uh, say uh, ha which has converter stations only has converter stations but no uh, transmission circuit. In this topology, uh, both sending and receiving and uh, converter uh, sit in the same location. Second one is a point-to-point -point configuration, you know, and within say point-to-point -point or uh, you could have a point-to-point -point overhead line application or point-to-point -point submarine uh, uh, cable application. And this with point-to-point -point connection, uh, it has sending and converter station in location one, receiving and converter station in location two with uh, of course transmission circuit uh, in between or connecting both, both station for for enabling power power transmission. The next configuration is multi-terminal uh, configuration, which has say two or more than two converters connected uh, together with different or uh, say same transmission circuits. So station one and station three, so that connection could be, you know, a cable or a line, whereas station one station could, you know, be a, a different transmission uh, circuit. This configuration is, is still considered within industry as, as fairly new uh, type of configuration, but could be the beginning of uh, DC grid networks in the, in the future. All these uh, configurations can be arranged in, in different topologies, you know, or say electrical circuit connections. You know, these, top, uh, these topologies are, are, called, are monopole, bipole with earth return and bipole with, with metallic return. Difference, say, between bipole with ground return and with metallic return is the one uh, with earth return, you know, uses ground or sea electrodes, not the cable or over a line uh, in case of, or which is the case with, with bipole with, with metallic return to carry, of course, the current, you know, when the redundancy is lost. There are, of course, pros and cons, uh, associated with all of them. Some are say, shown on the slide for, for information. Uh, let's pick uh, one or two, you know, and understand uh, uh, the, these, these uh, you know, pros and cons between topologies. Say, let's look at the, say, redundancy under fault conditions for, say, monopole topology. What can be seen, say, from the figure, there is a sending and converter, then there is a receiving and converter, and the transmission circuit arranged to form a loop, closed loop, in order to, of course, carry power or, or current. So if there is uh, a fault, uh, you know, in one of the converters, either, either sending in converter or, say, uh, receiving in converter, or even, or, or, or transmission in one of the transmission uh, lines or, say, circuit, you know, then the loop will be, will be broken and there will be no path for the current to circulate anymore between, between two ends, meaning there is no redundancy, means all power be lost, and there is no redundancy with this topology against, uh, against, against say, uh, fault. Uh, if we now take, say, uh, our attention to bipolar or topology, whether it's earth or metallic, you know, but let's look at the one with, uh, with metallic return. So, what it has is say sending end converter and receiving end converter with three transmission lines connecting all say all all four you know converters okay so if there is now a fault in one of the sub converters so either a fault in this converter or say in this converter 
or even in this transmission line, then only half of the loop will be will be lost. You know, meaning half of the rated power, you know, can still be transmitted through this this topology. Okay, so if the fault, you know, could be in say converter or this converter or transmission line, you know, only that that will mean only this circuit going out of service, not not this circuit. And with this circuit, you know, uh, uh, power half of the rated power, you know, can can still be uh, transmitted between between ends. Uh, and because say because of this, because uh, you know uh, you could see the cost for monopole, uh, 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 say uh, topology, you know, is is normal, is considered normal. Whereas with bipole, it is highest because it now it's now it is it is double the converters and one more, you know, transmission circuit in the or say associated with this with this topology. Uh, but with bipole, having said this, with bipole, you know, in terms of say uh, technical uh, benefits, its preference is higher than than monopole. But in terms of say economical benefits, you know, its preference, you know, is often seen as lower, you know, than than monopole. You know, so it's uh, it's it's really a balance between redundancy and and cost. You know, when it comes to uh, to select say between between a monopole topology and, and say a bipole uh, topology. Uh, this uh, slide, you know, shows the basic HVDC circuit. So it has, you know, a sending end uh, converter for conversion of say AC power to DC power. Then of course the DC transmission uh, circuit for carrying DC power between ends. And finally, uh, receiving in, you know, uh, uh, converter for conversion of DC power uh, back, to, back to AC power. Between say AC uh, grid point, you know, and the converter point at both ends, you can see that there is a transformer, which has, which has technical reason, such as say to provide electrical isolation between AC and DC, to limit uh, fault current, to provide reactance, necessary for the working of the converter you know and so on. similarly there is a there is a filter that is shown uh, it also has a technical reason such as in case of lcc it limits uh, transfer of transfer of harmonics generated by the converter into the ac grid as well as provide uh, reactive power support to compensate you know the reactive power absorbed by the converter whereas in case of vsc most of the time you know this uh, this this uh, this is not even like uh, required like i mentioned in the or say at the start of the presentation you know we, we're not going into or i'm not going to go into you know technical design details today i got this picture just to give you an overview of uh, say some of the some of the hvdc uh, equipments uh, for example say uh, one of the primary equipment in the converter station is, is the wall. You know, so the top picture shows a suspended arrangement, you know, for the for the wall, whereas the bottom picture shows you know the floor mounted arrangement for the for the wall. There are disadvantages, once again, disadvantages and advantages associated with both, such as say with suspended type arrangement, it is said that maintenance is often easier. You know, or simpler than than floor mounted type arrangement, but then floor mounted type arrangement is said to be say cheaper, you know, than the than the suspended type arrangement. Once again, please bear in mind that a lot, uh, you know, uh, goes into the design of the HVDC uh, system, which which I am not say uh, covering uh, today. Transmission voltage, you know, power rating, type of application, type of topology, you know, play a very vital role in the in the design of the HVDC system, which is said uh, technically, or which will be said technically as well as economically uh, feasible. Uh, so treat you know this this information you know uh, as as very high high level or say introductory. Uh, moving on, you know the next primary equipment uh, within say a converter station is the is the transformer. So the top picture uh, shows a transformer with say a GIS termination. There's the bottom picture. Uh, shows the one uh, with air termination, uh, and you could see, you know, how a dielectric strength of insulating medium can have significant impact on the on the size of the equipment. Uh, 
Next picture, you know, uh, or say next slide shows a, a filter yard, typical filter yard, you know, which is which is definitely required with LCC. And main reason, and it's, it is one of the main reason for LCC station being bigger in footprint than the VSC uh, station. Uh, uh, you could see this from this picture. This picture shows, you know, a reactor, which are these cylindrical uh, coils, resistor, which are these, these boxes and capacitor units, you know. So as this particular filter, so, you know, or say picture, uh, it, has, it, has, it, it shows three levels, you know, of combination of resistor, reactor, capacitor, and therefore it is it is a triple. It's a picture, you know, of a triple tuned filter. If there were two levels, you know, it would be a double tuned filter. And if there was a single, say, level, it uh, would be a single uh, tuned filter. Uh, next uh, picture. So this picture, you know, uh, shows say different designs for VSC HVDC. Uh, offshore platforms. So none of them are LCC HVDC uh, uh, platforms. They're all VSC HVDC, which are already say installed in service today. As you can see, most of these sizes, you know, are, are smaller than the size of a football ground. And this is what's making VSC technology an obvious choice for bringing, you know, offshore power to land in combination, of course, with other benefits, you know, which uh, I I, I talked about, you know, uh, when we uh, uh, when we compared LCC and and then VSC. Uh, this this slide, you know, uh, show say existing uh, and upcoming uh, HVDC interconnectors between uh, UK and Europe. All of them, uh, you know, use uh, uh, say cable. Uh, as transmission circuit, and most of them are VSC. Some are, you know, LCC, for example, MOIL, you know, it's, it's an LCC, IFA is an LCC, but uh, most of the most of the upcoming or, you know, uh, uh, or, or HVDC integrator that have come uh, recently or installed recently, you know, are the, are the VSC uh, type ones. Uh, looking, say, into the, uh, into the future role of, say, HVDC, uh, we well, at, at present we are still you know very much in the phase where most of the HVDC systems are say point to point connections with one or two terminal with terminal schemes you know however it is anticipated that DC grids you know may be may be a reality by by 2030 and uh, when that would be a reality, you know, most of the means the, the obvious configuration or uh, topology, you know, which uh, will be used uh, would be multi-terminal, you know, topology. Uh, next up, I say, is what we, uh, you know, do in North McDonald, you know, to support, say, our our HVDC clients. We are uh, associated, you know, with a number of HVDC uh, projects and provide, you know. Uh, uh, different consultancy services, uh, which say can be, which which are shown, you know, or listed on the on the left side of the slide, uh, and we provide such services in different roles, such as a consulting engineer, uh, planning uh, consultant, technical advisor, lender advisor, or owner engineer, depending on you know the stage of the project and and type of our client. We have uh, separate teams with expertise in converters, uh, cables, civils, study surveys, and uh, project delivery management to support, you know, both uh, uh, OEMs and, and different uh, set, of, uh, set of clients, you know. Uh, this, this list, you know, shows uh, some of our HVDC projects or some of the HVDC projects we've been, say, involved or associated with in, in different roles, once again, you know, as I like mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, you know as 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 like a final uh, slide from me you know uh, this this slide this particular slide you know shows a typical say project life cycle from development to commissioning uh, for uh, or say of HVDC system. You can see you know the execution stage is shown as say six, thirty six months typical. Cycle, you know, uh, 
is or is shown as six, 36 months. And once again, means this, this information is, is typical and could be shorter or longer, depending on say topology, uh, length of transmission uh, circuit, you know, so if there is, there is a, uh, if, if there is a cable scheme and the distance between your station, or say the transmission distance is is longer, then of course you know you require more manufacturing time to to manufacture your cable. So this this cycle you know could be could be longer. And uh, one of the one of the uh, vital factor you know which which plays a quite an important role is market availability. So if you are looking you know to uh, have an HVDC uh, uh, station when there are a lot of other HVDC uh, stations you know going going on as well you know uh, then then of course you know due to due to this due, based on market say availability you know this this construction this design manufacturing and construction phase could be could be longer you know than than 36 months uh, in this also in this slide you know feasibility phase is say shown as 18 months you know but this could also uh, vary depending on say uh, planning process you know site and subsea survey execution strategy because you you have to have your surveys ready you know before you enter design manufacturing construction phase and uh, sometimes site selection uh, process so if there are you know like more options uh, in terms of you know uh, sites to site your say uh, converter stations or more options in terms of routes to have your uh, uh, cable laid you know then then the selection uh, uh, process the site selection route selection process can also you know have an influence or impact on the on the duration of uh, feasibility and and design uh, phase okay uh, well uh, this is this is you know I, uh, all from me like today you know on the on the converters uh, uh, it's uh, it, it was you know just to give you maybe a basic uh, insight or overview of uh, HVDC uh, technology, you know, and its its types, uh, and what we uh, do, you know, to support our uh, HVDC clients. I'll I'll now say pass on, you know, the presentation on to my uh, colleague, uh, Jingyi, you know, to talk just about about uh, cables. Okay, so thanks for uh, listening. Okay, can everyone? Well, can everyone hear me? Okay. We can hear you. That's good. And my screen, um, which is hopefully coming. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, that's perfect. Um, and my camera, because I can share my camera. And we so, can see you. <laughs> that's perfect. Thanks, thanks Julie. And um, so thanks, Gaurav, a very uh, insightful presentation so far about the DC and converter. Uh, hello and welcome and thanks for staying with us. Before I start, I would like to thank uh, IET Success for inviting and facilitating this webinar. Uh, thanks to Julie who is here with us and thanks, uh, thank Bruce for the kind introduction. I am glad to share my knowledge for HVDC cable system and how they provide the essential connection of renewable energy generation uh, to transmission infrastructure. Uh, bear with me a second. I'm just going to turn on my light because it's getting a bit dark. <laughs> Do apologize. Um, so, um, to provide some background on driver for renewables, in 2019, the UK became the first major economy to make a commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. And offshore wind will provide a significant role in this transition and other renewable energies. Um, around the last 15 years, 10 gigawatt of offshore wind has ha was being constructed and, and are now in operation. And the plan is a total of more than 
75 gigawatts in 2050 in order to meet the net zero scenario. A critical infrastructure is to provide the connections, for example, connecting the offshore to onshore. So firstly, I would like to talk about cable construction. The history of cable system development began with a chemist who experienced with electrostatistics. Uh, who also was the first modern scientist to distinguish between conduction and insulation. In the next 100 years, there was a development of telegraph cables. And then in the next 50 years, there was development of electrical power industry. Uh, in the recent 50 years, we have seen a rapid development of transmission power for both the HVDC and the AC applications. And move on to the components of power cable. It consists of the following layers. Firstly, uh, the conductor. It is normal copper, but sometimes uh, aluminum. The choice of conductor material and design will affect uh, system losses cable handling, cable burial, vessel dead weight, and capital cost. Second, insulation. Uh, more detail will be discussed in the next topic about cable technology. Third, conductor and the insulation screens. These are essential for smoothing of the electric field, which would otherwise overstress the insulation. Fourth, screen and or sheath. Um, this has three important functions. First, it provides a ground reference for the uniform field distribution throughout the insulation. And second, it provides a hermetic cell against moisture. Um, and third, it provides a dedicate path for fault circuit therefore secure the operation of the protection systems and protect the cable from excessive fault damage. Fifth, armor. The armor wires offer only a limited protection from um, mechanical events such as anchor strikes. The pri primary purpose of the armor is to protect the cable from longitudinal strains during the insulation. The armor can be single or double layered. And six, over sheath or jacket or serve, uh, serving. Outer serving has an important function of provide a surface which can safely, which can then be safely handled. It is often provided with a brightly colored stripe to help visual identification. Other components including fillers, binder tapes, and water blocking layers. These are required to protect the cable from undesired water penetration and to provide a circular shape so that the cable can be easily handled. So that is the basic cable construction. Yeah. Move to uh, insulation. Um, the extruded insulated, uh, insulation cable are currently the dominant technology. Extruded insulation is composed of a solid polymer extruded onto the core uh, of the conductor in a continuous process. It replaces the fluid field cables for almost all application due to the reason listed in the slide, but namely uh, lower losses and simpler insulation and uh, maintenance uh, because there's uh, no requirement for the supporting infrastructure and lower environmental impact and lower flammability. And now I would like to talk about the second topic, which is cable technology. 
um, one major aspect is insulation. Table insulation can be mainly divided into two categories, um, lapid or taped or extruded design. For lapid design, there are three types, one of which is fluid field. So the fluid field gaps between the paper and the low viscosity fluid fills the gaps and maintain the insulation property of the cable. Uh, it is not generally used, which I mentioned before, and it is due to the potential environmental issue and the requirement for additional tents to manage the hydraulic pressure. Other types are mass impregnated uh, or mass impregnated with PPL. Uh, for extruded insulation, there are two types, uh, XLP and e EPR. And I will talk more detail in the following slides. slides. Uh, first one I want to talk about is the mass impregnated non-draining known as MIND insulation. Um, MIND use high viscosity impregnate impregnant that is not free to move and thus avoids the need for additional equipment to ma manage the hydraulic nature of the system. However, the gaps in the papers make the technology unsuitable for use above around uh, for with AC system above around 50 uh, kilovolt. The impregnant is generally kept solid, which limits the conductor operating temperature to around 55 degrees C. Um, MI technology is um, limited to HVDC application, and it is the only solution now for line uh, commutated converters, which um, my colleague uh, Gaurav mentioned, which is the LCC one. And um, MIPPL has a slightly different design and relies on the PPL for insulation, which theoretically allow the conductor to achieve a higher operating temperature. Uh, however, there's very limited HVDC experience with PPL design. And more detail about crosslink polyethylene, which is XLP insulation. It is the most common cable, cable insulation and it is the only extruded uh, insulation above 150, 150 kilovolt due to its uh, low dielectric losses. Cross-linking of the polyethylene retains a good electrical insulation characteristics and also allow for operating at a higher temperatures. So it is up to 90 degrees continuously for AC. It is, sus it is susceptible to degradation from moisture at distribution voltage. The solution is to add dopants to the insulation to retard the forma formation of water trees, which then allows for uh, so-called wet designs. Above distribution voltage, seamless screen are required to provide an impermeable water barrier. Uh, this is called a dry design. And a bit more detail about uh, ethylene pro propylene rubber known as EPR insulation. So the early experience with XLPE, so around 1970s, we have quite poor design and insufficient production quality assurance. And EPR was more popular in US at distribution voltage and um, it is rather un uncommon elsewhere. 
EPR can withstand higher voltage stress than XLPE, therefore allow for a thinner insulation design. And its water resistance also allow for wet designs. However, EPR has higher dielectric losses compared with XLPE. And that is why it is not used for voltage level above 150 uh, kV. And move on to another aspect of the cable system technology, uh, a fiber optic cable. So some time ago, when HB cable became popular, someone had the great idea to introduce the fiber optic cable uh, with the power cable. It is essential to be used for communication of offshore cable. This would likely to reduce some cost, especially during the installation. However, there are several important uh, FOC design, uh, namely, well, which is listed here, and namely the quantity of the spare and uh, the radial water barrier mat material, avoidance of mechanical strain being passed onto the embedded FO unit used for monitoring purpose. It also needs to have a solid grounding of the metallic parts at both ends. And we also need to be careful about the operating temperature. And it should be at least um, same level of, of our design of the power cables. Um, stay on the scene of fiber optics. One advantage of having the FO unit is the ability to be used for cable online conditioning monitoring. The technology including DTS, which is distributed temperature sensing and DAS, so distributed acoustic sensing. Um, one pre-fault condition of having a HV cable fault is that we might find all of the fiber start to go dark first. And this is normally a good indicator of something wrong with the cable. And this gives us the chance to react or preact with some maintenance measure to avoid the significant cost for the uh, high voltage cable fault. Okay, the next topic is about cable ratings. And for cable rating, this is all about thermodynamics. So this is mainly about how do we get the heat away from the conductor while it is operating. So in theory, we can actually use a one millimeter squared conductor and have a thousand amps as long as we can stop the conductor from melting. This is actually uh, related to the um, superconductors, but maybe we can talk a tiny bit more about this later. And the, where are we? Oh yeah, the current are calculated according to IEC uh, 60287, and this standard is widely used around the world. This standard uh, comes with three parts, which are listed here. It covers AC cables ac across the spectrum and only covers DC up to 5 kV. Anything about, above 5 kV, there isn't a recognized standard for calculating of the rating at the current stage. Although there are men, uh, some working groups looking into increasing the coverage voltage, uh, one way of doing the calculation is to reduce the frequency to one hertz which, which then reduce the reactive component. Uh, 
uh, move on to factors affect the ratings. This would broadly include anything that uh, would affect the temperature. Factors are listed in this slide, uh, which you can see here, uh, namely the following, um, like the ambient temperature where the cable is installed, the barrel depths, and not too deep, that would increase the thermal pass and other sources of heat, such as uh, like heating pipe nearby or other service nearby. And also solar radiation, particularly if the cable is close to the surface. She's bonding arrangement, mostly affect the onshore system and the, and the insulation method. All the factors need to be considered and they will change uh, along the route. So this would involve a detailed study along the whole route to understand how the cable is installed and how, what are the impacts. And uh, environmental uh, condi conditions are changing around the world as well. I'm sure we are all aware of global warming and the typical temperature for insulation within the seabed would consider to be around 10 degrees C. I'm sure it would be a variable number, usually around 10 to 20 degrees C, like say 10 degrees during the winter and 20 degrees C during the summer. Certainly on the uh, source code, or coast we see, which we can see from this figure, the summer is warmer, warmer at certain times of the year. And uh, now uh, often we see client requirement for the studies now increase the temperature from 15 degrees C to 20 degrees C to allow the impact of global warming. And um, two other factors affect the rating of AC system are skin effect and proximity effect. So um, the electrons are unsociable bonds really, and they are negatively charged. And as a result, they tend to go uh, at the edge. And therefore there's two phenomena. The first one is the skin effect and the second one is the proximity effect. So both of the if, uh, these effects means we can't fully utilize the conductor. Um, so the electri electrons are not distributed evenly. That, that is one of the reason why AC conductor is considered to why for the higher voltage we choose to go with DC. Okay. Next one. Um, so now I would like to talk a bit more about the um, cable system uh, in a bigger picture. And as HV cable system get longer and longer, um, there is a limit for how AC cable system can con connect the power to the grid. And due to the capacitive charging circuit within the cable system, the longer the cable system, the larger the capacitance. And for ma more ca capacitance, a bigger conductor is needed. And we would reach a point when it become an econ uh, economical or impossible to get sufficient power through the cable anymore. And um, okay, this one. So we, what we are seeing around the world now is that there are more and more interconnections going on. We are living in a distributed energy system and people are started to look into renewable sources for example, offshore and onshore wind farm, 
solar power around the world. So there is renewable power available somewhere. And the challenge here is how do we interconnect in the system to transport the energy produced in one area to another area and in order to uh, give us the, the opportunity to benefit from the energy that's available. And as we can see from the figure, uh, the demand for energy is increasing and the, the use of tra traditional fossil fuel is decreasing and the demand for renewables are increasing. And for renewables, the distance from the generation plants um, to connect to the connection of the grid are normally longer. And um, one of the problem with DC system is cost, which uh, my colleague Gaurav mentioned previously. Um, so as we can see from the figure, the terminal cost for DC uh, are higher than the equivalent AC system. However, for the AC systems, as there are three cores in the cable and um, AC cable system no normally required more conductor, uh, conductor material than DC and the line cost for AC is higher. As a result of these two uh, cost factor, there will be a critical distance and, and it is a variable depends on the design. And um, so in more general term, uh, it will be around 100 kilo kilometers. Um, next topic is about how the cable connection is important and how this is related to renewables. I think I briefly touched this on the previous slides about the global trend for the renewables, but um, I'm also going to cover a bit about the challenge for cable routing in this slide. Um, so take an example of offshore wind, um, a single offshore wind farm nowadays has the potential to generate more power than several fossil fuel power stations um, operating. And the greater wind speed offshore means the output from the wind, wind farms in our seas and, and oceans can be much higher than those online, on the line, on the, on the land. Therefore, the connections are, are needed. There are several industry uh, challenges associated with this. First challenge could be the um, cable routing and the burial. So the, the cable installation is going to uh, affect the cable rating, which I discussed previously. However, the cable routing has more aspect to be considered. So, so the offshore wind farm, it becomes um, more further and further from the land and it becomes in deeper waters. So it, it therefore it becomes increasingly complicated to identify up optimal cable routes and burial depths, hazard and the behavior of mobile sediments along the cable routes uh, need to be understood. And the uh, feasibility study through the uh, geophysical, hydrographical and the geotechnical are essential. And the comprehensive and accurate data analysis and the information sharing is also vital. So we need to create a single source of information which could support effective assessment of the obstacles, help to identify savings in cable route, and also to rise significant risk which may later occur during installation 
or operation and the ma maintenance. Cable routing and the, hmm. I think I, um, I'm a bit cautious with the time. So I'm gonna talk about the second challenge, which could be the connectivity and transmission. So the offshore wind farms are growing size and as uh, situated further from the shore, the effectively connecting the turbines to the substations and transmitting the power back to the land with minimal losses is a big challenge. And the third challenge could be uh, the world around us. So we, we need to be careful about the marine habitats and about the bird and uh, must be protected. And on the other hand, the expansion into regions which are more prone to extreme weather means we need to find a way to pr protect our offshore infrastructure. And the fourth challenge could be future innovations. We see rapid growth of technology since the first offshore array, which is started around 20 years ago. Um, it is important to always look into the future. And uh, this slide is just to say that a building a low carbon future is a global trend and a global effort as well. We need to have local resources and act in a cooperative manner in order to tackle the challenges together. So this is just to show our re response to this global feature. Okay, so for offshore wind farm, there are specific geographic locations which make the site feasible to generate power. And the challenge for the cable routing has been mentioned and the specific site also means we need customized design and uh, we would foresee different challenges for each development. So every project, they won't be the same. Well, won't be exactly the same. So this is really a multidisciplinary approach due to the complexity of the project and broad range of general and specialist skills are, are required. We would need to unite it, the engineering disciplines, including geotechnical, civil and electrical with planners, financial analysts, uh, safety specialists, as well as um, wind modelers, geologists and social and environmental scientists. Um, hope you are still there and awake my fellow if not maybe i could sing a song and as i am a terrible singer you would awake in shock but just bear with me this is the final slide and which is quite exciting this is about future innovation two examples are presented first we have the hydrogen being the next wonder fuel there are a number of schemes uh, together with the development of the offshore wind to run the electrolyzers and to provide green uh, fuel for us all. Um, this will of course produce new challenges on the infrastructure for the connections. And the second is floating wind farm. As the technology is developing for floating turbine, the te cable technology need to be developed as well. We need to develop dynamic cables and we would expect increasing amount of the offshore export cable in the future. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I will hand back to Bruce for Q&A session maybe. Well, thank you, uh, Jingyi and uh, Gaurav, for that uh, very interesting talk. Um, we've had a lot of questions um, asked during the course of the talks, 
So I'm, I'm going to have to um, just take a selection of those. Um, um, and apologies to those whose questions don't specifically get answered. It may be possible, um, maybe Jingi and Gaurav may be able to answer them afterwards and put them on, uh, you know, on the web afterwards, or even address them to the people who ask the questions. Um, but uh, I'll leave that to them. Um, the first question um, comes from Doug. A number of years ago, superconductors were the future. What's the position now? Can you answer that one, uh, Jingy or Gaurav, please? I, I, I can take uh, the, this one. Uh, the, the position is they are, see, they are still seen as uh, expensive. Expensive. I, expensive. Yeah, expensive. Yeah. It's, it's, it's. I could add a few more lines because um, mm -hmm. I, I do notice there, there, there are um, quite a lot of researchers on this topic and also uh, there are cable suppliers which are, have more focus and are more advanced in this technology. I, I would say there is definitely use for this technology, especially if the site is very constrained. And uh, if, say, it is an urban area, and we, we do need to have a, ve a, a very uh, small um, conductor size, then this is still uh, the, the best, well, maybe this is the only option uh, at the particular scenario. Yeah? Right. Thank you very much for that, um, Jingyi and Gaurav. Um, uh, Mike Underhill has asked a question. Um, will DC transmission in the future require much better semiconductor technology for diode rectifiers and SCR switches? Can anybody, uh, can either of you answer that, please? I'm, I'm slightly, I think, not clear. Better. Uh, I think the you know, uh, within industry, like like I mentioned, this HVDC is usually uh, get compared with HVAC. You know, and uh, the the performance wise, you know, uh, there has not been so many uh, so many you know like what uh, uh, disappointments. You know, uh, yeah, this HVDC performance, you know, is is accepted is acceptable. You know. Uh, worldwide you know with the with the current use of say semiconductor walls you know or uh, e equipment so uh, until and unless something you know drastically uh, say goes wrong you know i i do not expect uh, that you know uh, the uh, uh, the current uh, say uh, family of semiconductors you know would undergo a big change you know, if, if that answers the question. Hello? We, of, we, of course, can follow up uh, on this question if um, more information is required. So, Bruce? Yes, um, a third question is um, by Henry Buchanan. What steps are being taken to protect undersea cables from anchor damage? anchors on the ships yeah um yeah so the the first step is to do the survey properly uh, to do the cable burial assessment beforehand and um, have proper survey about what is happening in the region and what is on the seabed so the what is on the seabed and what is the sea what is the um say service like fission or navigation channel above it. So it, it's more about understanding the sites um, well in advance, that, that in my view, and um, it need to be properly studied. So it's better to, to find the route which the risk is lower than to protect the cable later. <laughs> in, well, so it's better to have some proactive approach in my opinion. Yeah, that's uh, thank you, thank you for that, uh, Jingyi. Um, and um, let me think. We've got uh, a question from Ian. Have there been any known cases of hydrogen generation within HV 
subsea, subsea cables when in operation? Hydrogen generation. So th there is one uh, scheme which uh, is about to uh, use the power generated from the offshore wind farm in order to like we, we transfer the power through the HVDC connection to onshore and to have the onshore electrolyzers. So I'm not aware of like hydrogen generation offshore. So I, I'm not sure whether it is a feasible future, but there are schemes which is to connect the offshore wind farm with the onshore hydrogen scheme. And then it's 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 a whole a whole cycle of green energy together. Thank you, Jingyi. Um, uh, Paul says uh, he, that he had to deal once with gas migration from subsea cables. Is this still a risk from HVDC wind farm cables? For example hydrolysis of small amounts of water slash damp that enter the cable at depth. Can you I ask? Um, I, I'm just, I think I know the question, but maybe this is because it's not a discussion, but we, we, we definitely can follow up on this. But, but I think it might be the water vapor or it might be the, uh, the hydrogen gas from the insulation, so it, it can be several sources of this um, uh, of this problem. And um, sorry, I I just what was the uh, question again? So Bruce, um, I, I just yeah. Well, let me find it again. Sorry. Oh, okay. I, mm. uh, yes, it was the question. The full question was mm. that uh, Paul had to deal with deal once with gas migration from subsea cables. Mm -hmm. Is this still a risk from HVDC uh, wind farm cables? For example, hydrolysis of small amounts of water and damp that enter the cables at depth under the pressure, I presume. Okay, okay, okay. So for the HV cable, uh, HVDC cable system, uh, oh, yeah, HVDC cable system, they normally have a lead sheath. So this is quite a solid sheath to prevent uh, any gas to migrate and potentially degrading the insulation. So the, the particular um, concern here is more applicable for a low voltage, well, medium low voltage cable, which probably is more for the array cable instead of the uh, uh, export cable or interconnectors. That's all. Um, I think I think we'll have to limit the number. We are running out of time a bit, so I'm going to take one. Do one more question from a, from Barry Kwok. In one slide, you highlight that weak AC system had stronger AC system. What does it mean? Please elaborate. Can either of you answer that? I can't recall the slides in my presentation. Uh, Gore, maybe uh, uh, do you recall weak AC connection? Yeah, the, the weak AC and the uh, weak AC, you know, where uh, you uh, see whenever like there is a, there is a fault event, you see uh, uh, a disturbance or say you see, you know, the frequency limits or voltage, say limits going going outside a steady state or say normal operating uh, range, you know, uh, a weak system, you know, normally in terms of SCR, which uh, stands for short circuit ratio, you know, weak systems have uh, lower short circuit ratios, lower than say a two, you know, or three, whereas uh, uh, strong AC systems, you know, have a short circuit ratio of uh, three and, and above. I think that's been clarified, Bruce. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Yes, thank you. Um, I think um, I think I'm going to draw it to a close now because we are getting a bit uh, out of time. I'm sorry for to the people whose questions haven't been specifically answered, but um, 
I'd just like to, on the behalf of the audience, I would just like to uh, uh, to thank the um, to thank our two speakers, uh, Jingyi and Gurav, for a most interesting lecture. Um, thank you for attending, everyone, and good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank okay. Thanks, Bruce, and thanks, Julie. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.